Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondap webinar in association with Inc. Law discussing the AI regulatory landscape across Canada, the US and Europe. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by a brilliant panel to take us through today's discussion. Before I hand over to the team to begin today's webinar, a housekeeping item, you can submit questions to today's panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. The panel will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible, but please do reach out to them after for any additional information you may require. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Carol to begin. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to our webinar on navigating the AI legal landscape. In a very short period of time, we have seen an enormous amount of activity in the regulatory uh, environment when it comes to artificial intelligence in particular. This webinar will give you a high level overview of some of the key regulatory developments happening in Canada, the EU, the US and beyond. We'll close the webinar with some best practices around AI governance and emerging practices to comply with the regulation as we see it and know it today. The purpose is really to be practical, to help think through some of the key requirements to get your organization ready for when this regulation is passed and ultimately comes into effect. From our perspective, uh, procedurally, AI is the new cyber. And so where you think about ways of organizing, planning, policies and procedures that may be needed, really think through some of the key areas that you did, that you instituted in your cybersecurity program, and we can find parallels to what you will see in the AI management program. We'll close the webinar on that particular point. My name is Carol Piavizan. I am the managing partner at Inc. Law. Inc. Law is a law firm uh, located in Toronto, Canada. We have uh, several offices throughout Canada and we focus on uh, data law, corporate and health law. I will turn it over to our special guest, Mariah Jaworski from Clark Hill for an introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me today, Carol and team. My name is Mariah Jaworski, and I am a member in the New York and California offices of Clark Hill. Clark Hill is an international law firm with 27 offices throughout the United States, uh, Ireland, and Mexico. And I practice, practice, excuse me, proactive data privacy and cybersecurity compliance on behalf of our Fortune 100 clients. Thanks, Carol. Hi everyone, my name is Michael Pascu. I'm a consultant with Inc. Consulting, uh, kind of the consulting counterpart to Inc. Law, if you will. Um, I've been very focused on the uh, kind of intersection between data governance and AI governance over these past few years in my kind of professional services career. My background is a bit of a dual focus, a bit of a, of a degree in commerce as well as a degree in computer science. Very excited for, for us uh, to have this conversation today. I think it's gonna be, uh, you're, hopefully everyone's gonna learn a thing or two. And um, with that, I think Aaron, maybe we can just jump right into it. Awesome. So I wanted to briefly just start our conversation today by level setting on what the term artificial intelligence means and kind of bring us through some of the benefits, give it some, some examples and some qualifiers just so that we're all kind of on the same page here. Now, obviously, if you you know look up what the definition of, of AI is, you'll you'll typically get some derivation of you know perceiving, synthesizing, inferring, aggregating, analyzing uh, information by a machine as opposed to you know a human. Now, in reality, the definition can kind of take many different shapes and forms. So, for example, uh, the EU AI Act defines it as a bit more broadly, right? It's an AI system, so that's kind of anything that can be. Uh, given a, a set of human defined objectives and generate outputs like content, predictions, recommendations, or decisions. And typically that includes kind of that strict, you know, definition of AI like machine learning, logic and knowledge based approaches, but then also more broad like statistical approaches. So things like estimations or search engine, so search optimization methods. Now, the reason I bring all of this up is that although the definition of an AI system is starting to converge, 
um, there will inevitably be a bit of difference in, in, let's say, for example, the EU AI Act versus Canada's Bill C-27. And some of these differences will be important to consider as we kind of go through forward our, our conversation today. So what you see on the slide here is what I would consider to be a more strict definition of, of AI. So your things like RPA, computer vision, knowledge graphs, NLP, generative analytics, and, and things of that nature. So with the advent of, of AI, obviously it should become as no surprise, comes with kind of a, a slew of different benefits. And it, it's no surprise that it's expected to add about 15 trillion to the, to the economy by 2030. And of course, lots of different benefits as well. So things like the automation of repetitive tasks, financial competitiveness, um, more accurate predictions, improved decision-making and, and things like that. I won't spend too much more time here. I think we're all kind of on the same page. So let's move to the next slide and, and maybe I can help contextualize what we mean by um, an AI use case or a system. So we'll typically, over the course of our conversation today, refer to AI use cases or AI systems. And broadly, what we mean by that is a specific application of AI for a given context. So for example, creating a new AI-based product, acquiring a new customer, risk modeling, or, or any of, anything of that sort. So uh, you know, these use cases can be applied in a variety of contexts. So for example, your next best conversation in healthcare, how we can more adequately allocate resources, and so on and so forth. Now, Ultimately, what this does is it kind of brings us to a series of questions that hopefully over the course of this conversation will become a bit more clear. So first of all, obviously, we've seen a lot of noise around ChatGPT and generative AI in the sense of artwork. Um, so, you know, there's just going to be a, an implication there on the future of work. Uh, naturally, there will be some employees who will be more, um, more, more likely to be replaced or augmented, and, and because of that, there will be severe or, 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 or meaningful policy changes and approaches that can help uh, alleviate some of that stress. Um, and on the same time, we, we come to these kind of questions about bias, transparency, resiliency, explainability, all of these kind of uh, risk areas, if you will. And you know, a lot of these emerging AI regulations that we'll kind of jump into are, are gonna be making a very big difference. And so over the course of our conversation today, we'll kind of dive into each of these questions and topic areas and, and risk areas, and hopefully we'll kind of get a more cohesive sense of how some of this regulation has evolved and how it's gonna be tackling some of those key questions. Um, so with that, I think what I'll do is maybe I'll pass it over to Mariah, who will kind of give us a bit of an overview of what we're seeing on the U.S. side of things before we jump into some of a global perspective as well. Over to you, Mariah. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, so on the screen, we have a timeline that demonstrates some of the activity in the United States, you know, from 2020 to present day. But the reality is, as Carol and I were talking about before this uh, presentation, this slide is in many ways already outdated because there has been so much activity in the U.S. in the last year to 18 months. And uh, with that chatter or that noise, it can be a very sort of stressful time for business. We can feel like we're playing whack-a-mole. We don't know where to look. You know, one regulation's coming out of left field. How do we as organizations address this ever-evolving regulatory landscape in the United States? Uh, the first way that I think we go about doing that is we need to understand there are four prongs to AI policy in the United States currently. And I say currently, this really is a snapshot in time because in the US, we do have federal data privacy proposals such as ADAPA that are slowly making their way out of, our, out of the house into committee, et cetera. And ADAPA as an example has an algorithmic integrity uh, provisions to it. So if we see activity and advancement of ADAPA in this, in this upcoming legislative session, then the four policy prongs uh, you know, certainly will be modified in favor of this larger federal scheme, but we're not there yet. Uh, so where we are currently is uh, the first prong of this sort of uh, regulatory landscape is existing anti-discrimination laws at both the federal and the state level in the United States that are being leveraged by regulators uh, for enforcement actions. So for example, at the federal level, we have Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. We have these historic federal laws that apply nationally. And we have a regulator known as the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission that is tasked over time with enforcing these laws. 
And the EEOC has taken that historic authority and is now applying it to these new technologies. So what are some examples of that? The EEOC last year rolled out its algorithmic integrity initiative. Just this month, it issued its strategic plan for 2023 and a major focus of the EEOC's strategic enforcement plan was stamping out algorithmic bias. So we're so that's the EEOC's way of indicating that we're going to see an uptick in enforcement actions brought by the federal agency. And we also have uh, the EEOC already taking action. So last year, as one example, the EEOC brought an enforcement action in the Eastern District of New York against iTutor. And the allegation there was that the iTutor company was utilizing a platform that automatically screened out candidates with a birth date um, over a certain year that indicated they were 55 years or of age or older. So essentially discriminating against those with um, those older applicants. So that's the EEOC sort of initiatives at the federal level. At the state level, we have these same anti-discrimination dictates baked into state laws. And we have particularly in uh, New York and California, but in other states as well, we have regulators in these states leveraging their historic state law authorities to address AI, ML, and automated decision-making tools. An example of that in New York is the New York Department of Financial Services. This is the entity in New York that licenses uh, insurance companies, banks, financial entities to do business in the state. And what New York DFS has done is it has uh, conducted investigations into lending practices. So a good example is uh, the Apple Card and Goldman Sachs's underwriting of the Apple Card. Uh, there were allegations that DFS received that the card was giving essentially better lending terms and higher credit lines to men over women. So the DFS conducted an investigation into that. DFS has also issued letters to insurers in the state reminding them that they need to uh, be focused on and have practices in place to evaluate the quality of their data uh, and that algorithmic bias in claims processing is, uh, is prohibited by the state law. So an example of a state agency leveraging its historic authority to address some of these new AI, ML, and automated decision-making uh, tool concerns. Same thing in California. Just uh, last year, we had the California Attorney General issue letters to certain healthcare entities, uh, letters of inquiry, asking for information from certain healthcare entities regarding their use of AI ML uh, for healthcare decision making. So that's really prong one, existing historic anti-discrimination laws leveraged in a new way. Uh, the second prong is we have some new city laws that are geared uh, directly at automated decision-making tools. The most prominent example of that is going to be New York Local Law 144. This is a law that applies to New York uh, uh, businesses and em employers and employment agencies who hire New York candidates. And essentially this law is important because it's really the only enacted law there's other proposals, for example, DC has the Stop Algorithmic Integrity Act. You know, there's different proposals that pop up, but New York is really the only enacted law. Um, and that law is interesting because it provides a framework for how businesses should deal with uh, the use of these technologies. So at a really high level, uh, Local Law 144, which uh, we anticipate will be in, it for formally enacted on April 15th of this year. It's still going through some public comments, uh, but it requires businesses to provide disclosures around their use of these technologies to give candidates and job applicants the opportunity to opt out of the use and to have a human uh, alternative to, uh, to, the, to the tool. Um, and then, you know, most prominently, and I think what's gotten the most attention is that law does require an annual bias audit by an independent auditor. And recent regulations have uh, updated or confirmed that independent really means independent. It can't be an internal team that is involved in either sort of creating the tool or using the tool. It has to be truly kind of independent to the organization. 
Um, and then the law requires the publishing of the, of the results of that bias on an annual basis. Um, so a lot of attention has been paid to this law in, in large part because it is the first of its kind. Um, and then, so we have those kind of city laws popping up. And then we also have our state data privacy laws that have uh, some opportunity for regulation around automated decision-making tools. An example of this is the California Consumer Privacy Act uh, amended by the CPRA, which has um, a process and, and we're expecting regulations from the state regarding uh, the use of automated decision-making tools, AI, ML, for profiling of consumer behaviors. So we're expecting that this year as well. So that's the second prong, kind of this uh, new and emerging laws that are directly geared towards these tools. The third prong is going to be this technical guidance that's issued. There's a lot of fanfare around, for example, the White House's release of the AI Bill of Rights. That was a very you know, interesting um, proposal, but fundamentally it is a voluntary sort of aspirational proposal. Uh, businesses can leverage this as best practices and guidance but there's no teeth, it's not enforceable. Another example of this technical guidance is uh, we're all really anticipating, and, and I know NIST has indicated very recently because of chat GPT, that it will be almost expediting the release of its framework for the use of AI tools. So that's the third prong, kind of these um, technical guidance that you can leverage on a voluntary basis. And then the fourth prong in America, because we are a litigious society, is the creation of sort of judicial law and precedent. And when we last spoke, I had said we were anticipating the filing of class actions uh, regarding bias and, and discrimination uh, arising out of the use of these tools. And we have since seen the filing of at least one case. That's going to be Husky versus State Farm. That was filed in December of last year in Illinois in federal court. And the allegations there, very interesting, are that black homeowners were being discriminated against at a higher, or their claims, their homeowner insurance claims were being delayed and denied as compared to their white homeowner policy counterparts uh, because of State Farm's use of these automated uh, claims processing and claims decision-making tools. So that's a piece of litigation that we'll be following um, and monitoring. And, and the, the violations that were actually alleged were violations of the Fair Housing Act. So really high level, those are the four prongs to US regulation. And if you're a business in the US, and Carol, I know we're gonna talk about best practices, you know, the real strategy here is sort of consolidating these four prongs into a, one framework so that your organization can effectively utilize AI ML and automated decision-making tools in a way that is hopefully most responsive to some of these um, regulations. We don't want to be updating our compliance posture every three months or six months, right? It's about laying that foundation so we can achieve an outcome of safe and effective use. And we can talk down the road what that means in the US. Great. So moving moving along, thank you, Mariah, because I think that really sets the framework for what we're going to be talking about next. So every single one of these slides, frankly, could be its own webinar, to be fair. Uh, this is very much sort of an environmental scan, a survey of some of the leading legislation that we see around the world. And as Mariah mentioned very um, rightly, there has been a flurry of activity in the last 18 months from a regulatory perspective, also as Michael noted, from a technical perspective. We're seeing more and more interesting use cases that are testing the bounds of our existing laws as they are historically defined and really incentivizing a modernization of some of our laws to protect against specific and identified harms typically in specific and identified sectors. And we're gonna see that in the summary of the EU AI Act. Um, for now, the trends that we're seeing um, it are that you know, every major economy has an AI strategy. We have the US, EU, Canada that have proposed laws. The US, as you've heard, also at the city level has some laws that are about to be enacted. Uh, China, Brazil have also passed laws related to AI. 
Um, and then otherwise, what we're finding is that there are a number of best practice frameworks, such as what you see out of Singapore, um, and increasingly what we're hearing out of countries like Dubai, where there are sort of ethical AI, responsible AI, trustworthy AI, we're hearing it in a number of different characterizations, but the point really getting at how are we leveraging this technology in a way that mitigates the inherent harms that are associated with such a sort of sophisticated and robust technology. Um, and you've already heard the flurry of activity happening in the US. There are also a number of AI regulatory sandboxes being piloted throughout Europe and the UK as well. So what we'd like to do in the next few slides is start to connect the dots. Mariah ended on what this means for your business. From our perspective, it's really important that you understand how there are similarities in some of the emerging laws so that you can structure an AI governance program that is effective. To the next slide, the EU AI Act is still very much in discussion. Uh, at this stage, we understand it to be regulating high-risk AI systems that are characterized in specific terms. Um, so the annex to the draft already identifies some clear areas where a system would fall within the confines of AI high-risk. Uh, biometric identification of natural persons, you have anything that manages critical infrastructure. We actually see this as cybersecurity legislation as well in Canada, the EU, and the US, among others. Education and vocational training, so ed tech, the use of artificial intelligence in, in um, education and training is identified as potentially high risk because of the degree to which um, some of those systems may interact with individuals and the effect that those systems may have depending on their use on the long-term long employability or, the, frankly, the current employability of certain individuals. Same in um, employment and workplace management. So as you heard, local law 144 in New York is focused on employment and recruiting. This is an ongoing theme that where we're using AI systems that may have an impact on a legal or similarly situated legal right to adopt a little bit of that Article 22 GDPR language that we see the law trying to um, require certain accountability and mitigation measures in place to ensure that those systems are really being used in a thoughtful and um, sort of risk appropriate manner. Um, we also have anything related to any systems that are being related to the use of private and public services and benefits from a public perspective, a public um, sector perspective, law enforcement, border control, and broadly the administration of justice and democratic processes. So these are very broad categories. There's a lot that we need to sort of unpack there. And there is a lot of discussion in re with respect to the EU AI Act and its applicability, uh, you know, ranging all the way from should it be applicable to general AI, should it be a applicable or general uses, or should it be applicable um, in a more narrowed scope? Uh, and the anticipation is a more sort of narrowed scope is what we'll see, but we'll have to we'll have to wait and see on that one. Next, just pulling out some of the key themes of the draft AI Act. The reason we've pulled out these particular themes is because again we see a consistency in requirements across different jurisdictions, and there are concrete steps that you can take today in your business to start operationalizing some of these requirements. So the Draft EU AI Act is already calling for a risk assessment and, man and risk management infrastructure in place. So what you'll see is that in the Canadian context, we have that as well in our draft laws. Um, as well as what we've seen in the US context, some requirements that are either associated with existing laws or emerging laws specific to, to um, AI that require that assessment of risk. Even when you think about it, Mariah, in the class action context, I mean, when you think about how you're gonna defend against that class action, you're gonna to wanna to show that you have turned your mind to all of those hard questions related to the use of your AI system in context, and you've taken reasonable, appropriate measures to mitigate that harm. So even where you're not specifically complying 
with a legal requirement, you've got that common law guidance that's telling you to get your diligence binder in place. We know that there are all eyes on these systems. There's a lot of public distrust with artificial, the use of artificial intelligence, specifically in more sensitive contexts. So having that diligence process in place to um, have your, your sort of defense ready to go is really critical. Uh, just pulling out some of these points, uh, we see that there needs to be a continuous and iterative assessment process. It's not a one and done in the world of artificial intelligence because it is such a dynamic technology that responds to its data environment. So a continuous and iterative risk management process, really, as I said, identifying some of those foreseeable risks, estimating the value, and then putting in place an appropriate mitigation plan. What we'll see in the draft Canadian law is that mitigation plan is super important when it comes to compliance, assuming the law passes. And it could be a record that is sought by the Minister of Innovation um, or a delegate of that minister if there's any major question about the potential harm of that system. Um, transparency is another key theme that we see, both from an ethics AI and AI ethics perspective, as well as what we see being brought into the regulatory environment. And transparency, as you heard in Local Law 144, you will see it in different uh, jurisdictions. You'll find it in AI Verify of Singapore. Transparency is about, put, in fact, you'll see it in privacy laws as well. Um, but it's it really is about enabling individuals to understand when they're interacting with a high risk or high impact AI system. It's providing sufficient disclosure about those systems. And then it's about really undertaking the appropriate assessments on your end to ensure that you're using that system as intended and in a manner that is sort of compliant with uh, the overall um, use case of that particular system. In addition, we see some requirements uh, to assess the data. What data inputs were used to train the system and then how does that impact the outputs? We see this in draft legislation across the different jurisdictions that we're talking about. That, that component of data validation verification, system validation verification, and then ongoing monitoring of outputs of AI systems in more sensitive use cases. These are three key themes that I really want you to take away as you think about what your AI governance program will look like. In addition, we have uh, human oversight. So is there a degree of human control? Mariah mentioned that in the local 144 context, you can opt out of being subject to an automated decision system. This is true under uh, proposed Canadian law. It is true under aspects of GDPR. Again, you know, highlighting article uh, 22 of the GDPR and automated decision systems that have that impact on legal and similarly situated legal rights. So we find some of that theme coming into the AI context as well, trying to wrestle some of that control into the hands of individuals that are on the receiving end of these systems. Just moving to the next slide to cover one more theme, and that has to do with monitoring and reporting. So increasingly we see in the EU context, they're proposing specific record keeping requirements, um, trade names, intended purpose of the system. This is the, I want to pause on this for one second because the intended purpose of the system is really important from a, a technology regulation perspective, meaning we're regulating artificial intelligence, but also what we see in a sectoral perspective. So for instance, think about software as a medical device and the use of artificial intelligence in medical devices. Identifying that intended purpose is associated with the risk classification your device might get. And if that changes, if the intended purpose changes because of the data environment in which the device is located, then you need to have a mechanism to monitor that. So you may actually find yourself, depending on your sector, you might find yourself in a situation of overlapping laws one that are sectoral and then the other that that might cover depending again on where you live uh, the technology itself so in the eu context understanding that intended purpose of the ai system and then being able to identify any certification marks 
and conformity assessments that may have been passed will be really important and may have to be handed over to a regulator. Uh, Michael will talk a little bit about what some of those features of the conformity assessment look like as we look to standards to help us give better guidance and a little bit more meat to the bones of some of this draft regulation. And then finally, we're starting to see in the EU context specific authorities that are designated for the sort of enforcement and monitoring of AI systems. Uh, and there has certainly been some inspiration drawn from this in the Canadian context as well, where there is a proposed delegation to a specific um, a delegate of a minister that would have specific oversight of AI and data. So let's move to the Canadian context quickly. Again, having done a very, very high level survey of the EU draft AIA. So Canada recently proposed a draft law called the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act. And this would be a federal law that seeks to govern high impact AI systems. Now the draft law doesn't actually define what high impact means, but we are expecting some regulatory guidance um, um, in the next probably four to six weeks. So keep your eye out if you're in Canada or operating in Canada, keep your eye out for that. Because as it stands, the law doesn't, the draft law doesn't give us a ton of information about what specifically it will be covering. I think we can already um, look to existing guidance to get a sense of what the law is worried about, but we will certainly wait for that guidance to come out in the next few weeks to better understand how the law is defining high impact systems. But what's really interesting here, and again, I want you to pay attention to these consistent themes. You know, we've got impact assessments that we find under the EU AIA under the, A, the Algorithmic Accountability Act, the draft federal law in the US, um, under ADPA, the provision around algorithmic integrity. So this concept of an impact assessment, Michael will also talk about it in the context of standards. It's, it, it's one of those key features that you will have in your governance program. Your risk assessment plan and your mitigation plan will be another key feature. And you see it here referenced as one of the accountability requirements in the Canadian context as well. Um, again, I think drawing inspiration from some of the draft laws that are already out there in the US and EU. Um, a monitoring, so this go back to continuous and iterative. In the Canadian context, there will be a requirement that you continue to monitor, and this is true in the, e, in the New York context, for instance, where you've got an annual bias assessment. The idea is that you are able to demonstrate uh, continuous monitoring of these high risk use cases, these systems that are being used in high risk instances, so that if it does, if the intended purpose changes or there is a harm, an unintended consequence of these systems, that you're able to mitigate that harm before you have a massive class action about widespread bias. That's very much the intention there. Record keeping becomes a key feature of the draft, uh, what we call ADA, so AI and Data Act. Um, it, the record keeping of your various accountability mechanisms will be very important if this law is passed. In any event, whether the law is passed or not, going back to Mariah's point of your class action defense, having these features in place will not only support compliance with potential regulation, but will certainly support a defense posture if you do find yourself in a situation either as a developer or as a deployer of these systems where your systems are under significant uh, judicial scrutiny. Public notice is another requirement under the Canadian law, again, drawing inspiration from different jurisdictions. Uh, the, the desire to enable people to understand when they're operating or they're interacting with a high risk system is important. If there's a particular harm that may be caused, it is important for people to understand this. And really it's, to underpin those values of sovereignty and agency so that individuals, at least in theory, the law is enabling individuals to exercise those rights one way or another. We'll have to see exactly how that happens in the end, but certainly that is the spirit of the law. Uh, notification to users in case of a material harm. 
You can see some of this already taking place in the New York context. You can certainly see it in other draft laws. Uh, and that, that uh, ability to notify individuals publicly also creates an internal accountability. Nobody wants to go out with a terrible news story and then roll with it, right? So if you've got that notice requirement, it will, it's almost like another way of, uh, another check and balance on your own systems. Finally, in the Canadian uh, ADA, draft ADA, there would be significant ministerial oversight with delegation to a possible data and AI commissioner. So this, the, the ministerial oversight would enable the minister to uh, demand an audit, uh, to receive some your you know, information related to your risk mitigation plan, your record keeping, your public notices or other notices. And in the case of imminent and significant harm, in this draft law, the minister would actually have the opportunity and the right, the power, to shut down the use of that system until there can be demonstration that there isn't that um, imminent harm. So I'll just move forward and turn it over to you, Michael, to walk us through some of those key standards that I've been referencing. Sounds great. So yeah, before we hop into that kind of AI governance discussion, uh, I'm going to kind of speak a little bit about some of the standards that we're seeing emerge across the board and kind of that convergence. And, and we're seeing a lot of this in, in a few different areas. So take, for example, the EU AI Act, right, Carol, you mentioned something that's like an impact assessment. Great. Well, what does that actually include? And what is what is actually, um, what does an organization actually need to do to comply with quote, a quote unquote impact assessment? And so that's kind of the the value that a lot of these standards are, 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 are bringing to the table and helping to clarify. So we've seen a lot of, of movement here, uh, IEEE, ISO, IEC, um, we, there's a laundry list on this page here. I won't go through each, of, each and every single one, but largely what we're seeing is this convergence on kind of five or six key themes. So first of all is, is this concept of, of data and AI governance. So that's, you know, developing, especially when we're talking about high risk systems, uh, with strong criteria for things like your training, your technique selection, your model validation, your training and testing data sets, and, and having standards surrounding all of those concepts. Uh, your technical documentation and record keeping, so how we can ensure that relevant, obviously, technical documentation is made available, um, and how we make sure that logs uh, are kept where uh, where the description or or the 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 way in which the system behaves is logged in a way that actually can provide a way for users to go back and see what decisions were made and why. Um, human oversight and transparency is another set of standards. So how we ensure that the operations of AI systems themselves are transparent to those who are impacted, as well as how we kind of ensure the uh, appropriate degree of human involvement or, or human in the loop. Um, accuracy, robustness, and cyber, I think this one's a bit more self-explanatory since there's already been some standards here that have been uh, communicated across on the way that we kind of help maintain accuracy and robustness of, of systems, as well as more broadly cybersecurity considerations as well, how we can prevent external threat actors from reverse engineering our systems or malicious data being injected into said systems. And then uh, one that's very interesting is this concept of, of management systems. And so you'll see there on, on the page ISO, uh, 42001 uh, artificial intelligent management systems this is kind of one of the the, the big ones here in terms of um, how how again while it's still in development there's a few things that we can kind of glean from it and kind of understand so the scope of this specifically is any organization that's using products or services uh, that use AI systems. So that includes both vendors as well as kind of those who are using or, or ingesting AI systems within to their environments and using them for their operations. Um, the risk areas that it cover, again, we're, we're kind of seeing a bit of a convergence here. There's been various different char characterizations of some of these risks, but the way that they frame it are, are fairness, security, safety, privacy and robustness. And you also have things like, you know, your accountability and availability and maintainability, both of the data and of the system itself. Um, and within these standards, there are, again, those explicit mentions of, of, of a couple key ter terms. So the first of which is an AI risk assessment. So that specifically refers to the development or the implementation 
of a risk assessment process that not only aligns to your AI policy and your AI objectives, but also one that can provide you know, consistent, comparable results that identifies the risks in a way that helps you actually um, and uh, tie it to your specific controls. So that's the second thing there is, is developing a process that helps select the appropriate controls for each of the identified AI risks as part of that AI risk assessment process. And another key interesting piece here is this kind of new concept of, a, of an AI system impact assessment. So of course you need a process to actually facilitate that as part of your model development process. That's great, but also uh, it kind of helps sets forward like, okay, what do you actually need to look at as part of your AI system impact assessment? So within that, you, you have things like legal positions, human rights, life opportunities, but some of these are, are also linked back to kind of those key risk areas of things like fairness, things like bias, right? How are you assessing your systems for those impacts and how are you helping mitigate that as part of your model development practices? Um, and of course, policies and procedures, I think this is kind of table stakes. Of course, each of these things will need to be embedded within your policies and procedures. So how you operationalize things like risk controls, how you can operationalize that impact assessment as part of your model development practices, all of that has uh, some sort of standardization, but more broadly uh, will be very important as we see some of these standards converge. Um, we'll, we'll start to see a bit more clarity on, okay, you know, I have a system impact assessment within my organization, we've been piloting it, that's great, but when do I need to do it? How do I need to do it? All of that is gonna be um, clarified as, as, uh, as we see more of these standards converge. Now, there are a few implications for this, of course, uh, legislators, like I think Carol, you mentioned the EU AI Act, uh, of course, uh, you know, something that is, is known as a, a conformity assessment. So a conformity assessment broadly might be required uh, or, or looks like it will actually be required as part of the EU AI Act if you want to operate within that specific jurisdiction. So uh, within uh, 42001, that we, we don't have an exact understanding of what that conformity assessment looks like yet, but with respect to global organizations that want to operate within the EU market, what we're going to see here is um, the need for that conformity assessment to be done. So essentially what that means is if you're an AI vendor or, or, or um, someone who's selling your services or products within the EU market that is going to be using AI technologies, uh, there is a strong possibility that there will need to be a conformity assessment done to actually operate within that market. So yes, there will be an impact for um, you know, EU domestic EU companies that operate within the EU, that's great. But also any company around the world that wants to operate in that market will need to have that conformity assessment completed. Um, so I think um, that largely covers what I wanted to talk about here. I think, we'll, we'll, again, we'll have to keep a very close eye on what that conformity assessment looks like. But uh, overall, lots of movement in the standard space. But the more exciting thing is that, again, that very strong convergence on those four or five themes that is making, um, you know, irrespective of which one you choose, you're likely going to start seeing a lot of that that um, that that uh, convergence within EU markets, NA markets, African markets, East Asian markets. It doesn't matter. We're seeing a lot of convergence and, and you're going to have to keep your eyes peeled for that one because it's going to be very exciting. So I think uh, if, if Mariah or Carol, you have nothing else to add, maybe I'll hand it back to, to you, Carol, yeah, to go through some of the AI governance discussion here and how organizations can actually help get started. Great. And Mariah, please jump in because you'll see that I'm referencing the NIST standard here. So mm -hmm. what I really wanted to try, what, we, what we're trying to do here is summarize and extrapolate from the draft law because trying to stay ahead of all of these different processes, you can just pick one jurisdiction and it's hard enough. Uh, if you're trying to do it as a global company or a global organization or even with ambitions to go global, uh, it can be really challenging to not only stay ahead of a very fluid privacy uh, regulatory environment, which is implicated by virtue of the data inputs and the regulation of that those data inputs. Um, but now looking at the regulation of the technology that's processing that data, uh, that in and of itself can be quite challenging. So to help you think through what your governance program should look like, the first thing that we always say is don't build new, build on. So you <laughs> probably have a robust data governance program in place or a privacy program in place. Um, really try to take a look at what you have and build on the infrastructure that you have. 
there are unique elements to an AI governance structure that you will have to bake into your data governance process. But in, in many ways, these laws are forcing companies to think differently about the way, about what they're um, accountable for and what they're governing and how. Uh, so it's super important to start with the culture element and to make sure that there is sufficient training, data literacy, understanding about why these systems are amazing and interesting, but also what are some of the risks associated with these systems and how the organization is seeking to mitigate those risks. There are also different processes related to questions to do with ethics in particular, um, and that really is the issue of do you, you know, not, not only should you do something or could you do something, but should you? And so thinking about when you'll be asking those questions and how you'll be addressing those questions throughout either the development of a high risk or high impact AI system or its deployment, those are really key variables. What you have here is sort of our five point plan, if you will. So if you walk away with nothing, um, other than this, then I feel like we've done a great job. Um, so the data governance, the AI governance program or AI management program, however you want to name it in your organization, in order to align with the existing most likely AI regulation in various jurisdictions, uh, number one, there will have to be a robust process around data testing and validation, particularly for bias and non-discrimination in these high risk or high impact contexts. Uh, there will be AI impact assessments that are required in these contexts. And if you look at the Algorithmic Accountability Act draft federal law in the US, there is a correlation between sort of high impact and stakeholder engagement in particular instances. So really think about what that stakeholder engagement could look like and frankly, um, how that might be baked into an impact assessment and baked into a design and deployment process. There are risk assessments that are required for the system. So you'll need some kind of model validation or verification of your system. You'll wanna retain that documentation. Think about when you want that documentation under privilege versus when you're comfortable for it not to be under privilege. Um, at some point, some of many of these uh, reports will need to be provided either to a regulator or potentially publicly, as in the case of Local Law 144. So just think about what your process will look like to undertake those validation um, assessments. An incident response plan will be very important. So you would have done all of your hard work in thinking through the material harms, the material risks, the foreseeable harms, the intended purpose, and then you need, as you do in cyber, a response plan in case something goes wrong. So who are you going to turn to? Who is your external forensic expert? Or who is your external legal team? Who is your external PR team? Who's going to support that process of if something goes wrong and how do you get yourself ready for regulatory and potentially uh, legal scrutiny? And then, as I mentioned, there are specific policies and procedures that are unique to AI in a sense. So for instance, explainability policy and process may be something that you require in your organization, depending on the context of the systems that you're building. Human control and decommissioning policies might be something you need in place. Uh, the inventory may be something, an AI inventory would be something that a number of different jurisdictions are requiring. Under Canada's draft proposed privacy law, we have an inventory requirement for automated decision systems. So it doesn't even need to be an AI system. It needs to be an automated decision system that falls within a very particular definition. Um, and then you need processes to ensure the safety and security of your AI systems, again, depending on context. All of this will be depending on those first few impact asset or first few assessments that you undertake, being both your impact and your risk assessment. From there, your governance program may be triggered, again, uh, depending on that output. Um, and then finally, some disclosure and notice policies. So when, what is the nature of the disclosure and notice that would be required? Who's gonna have oversight and responsibility for what that looks like? Always think about legal and the role that legal may play in drafting some of those uh, disclosure policies. Um, and then Carol, really- I'm sort of, jump in. Oh, sorry, yes, if you don't please. mind, on number five, because I think another component, we've got policies and procedures, and then we also really have our contracts, right? Our vendor management um, practices, because not, not every business is de 
developing in-house, some businesses are utilizing vendor technologies and, and other tools. So we really need to look closely at that relationship. We need to do our own intake assessment of the vendor and our due diligence around uh, the vendor. There are standard questionnaires. The Data Trust and Alliance has a, a questionnaire that they've published in the workforce space, certainly leveraging counsel uh, and adding to existing ISQs for vendor management. Uh, to ask questions specifically targeted at uh, the AIML tools is really important. And then on the back end, uh, you know, we saw the rise of like data processing addendums, cybersecurity addendums. We're now seeing the rise of AI addendums. We are negotiating um, indemnification, liability schemes. We're talking about data accuracy, as you mentioned. I mean, is it our data? Is it your data? Who's responsible for the consents, obviously, but also who's responsible for the accuracy? So I think that's a big component. It's not just policies and procedures, but it's also communicating those policies and procedures into contractual language. You know what? And you you literally got to the next place that I was going to get to. So <laughs> I still want to drill down on this point, though, because um, this is an issue. The vendor management process is already complicated enough when you just think about data and security. Um, in addition, are there any sort of specific contractual um, requirements that you're seeing being put in place right now for AI vendors? And uh, do you have any advice on how best to manage that procurement process? I There's absolutely contractual provisions that are being put in place through standalone addendums is what I'm seeing. And then not just is there the contractual addendum, but many um, businesses might also want to consider the use of tech e &O insurance. Uh, so another thing that we saw on the rise of cybersecurity, to go back to your earlier point about AI being the new cyber, you know, we saw 10, 15 years ago, the contractual requirement that vendors have one or $5 million in cyber coverage. We are now seeing the contractual requirement that vendors have some form of tech you know, insurance in place. If, you know, we get to the point where there is uh, some defaults or deficiencies in the use of the technology. So that's certainly a provision that we're looking at and drilling down on. But uh, to go back to my earlier point, it's really about understanding who's responsible for what. Um, kind of like SLAs and, and SaaS contracts, who's responsible for ensuring that this uh, technology and this tool works as advertised? Are we going to have reps and warranties around the use of this technology? Um, and then of course, on the back end, LOLs and indemnification provisions are, are very important. Absolutely. And the other thing that we're seeing increasingly is around supply chain of data. So who is doing that data labeling? Um, where is your data coming from? Is the AI vendor aligned with your sort of supply chain values? And um, increasingly, what is the relationship between your AI systems, your AI vendors, and your ESG reporting requirements? So we're seeing that starting to be baked more and more because frankly, there's a ton of risk that um, from a public company perspective, you're taking on through data and you know privacy, cyber, and now AI, that having those clear disclosures drafted can be extremely valuable. Uh, this is true in the acquisition process as well. Do clear due diligence that incorporates uh, AI considerations, both ethics and legal, if you're going to be uh, acquiring an AI company, particularly operating in a more vulnerable space. Uh, Michael, one question to you before we close. Uh, there is so much happening, and we've talked about this now, like how would you advise a, a, an individual or company to stay ahead of all of this movement in the AI regulatory and technical space? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, parring, parring your own research and podcasts, I think at, at the organizational level, there are a few things that you can do. Um, I think a lot of this falls under the mandate of kind of your your conventional, you know, your, your GRC, your, your legal and compliance functions. And I think a lot of, um, you know, sure, it's side of desk, but I think more and more as we're starting to see a lot of the prolifer proliferation of a lot of these regulations and legislation, um, I think it's very important to create the space for those folks to have the the capabilities to actually do some of that research and see how some of it's impacting their organizations um i think broadly you know 
you might also need external support, um, having having you know legal or or advisory support there to help uh, do some of that work for you to help alleviate some of the stresses that come with uh, navigating a very convoluted regulatory and legal landscape. Um, but, but yeah, I think I think a lot of it has to do with that, and then naturally, um, you know, we're we're fortunately starting to see a lot of convergence here. So hopefully, as as things get a bit more clear, um, you know, it can it can go back to being a bit more of a side of desk things as, as things are are starting to slow down, and and we're starting to see a bit more clarity. Um, and also look for you know kind of that high level uh, or or not high level, but the big name. Uh, regular, like look at the leaders, right? Like take advantage of of those leaders in the market and see like see what what's going on in in their regulatory landscapes because a lot of this usually finds its way to trickle down to kind of secondary and tertiary markets. So by all means, you know, take full advantage of all of that and and see if you can take a thing or two from them and and make your lives a little bit easier as well. Anything else you you want to you add there, uh, Mariah? I'll I'll have one parting thought, which is um I just wanted to say like let's take a deep breath. This feels really overwhelming because of all the um, regulatory advancements, if you will, and, and it just feels like there's constant movement in the regulatory space. But to go back to Carol's earlier point about AI being the new cyber, when we saw the introduction of cyber regimes, and especially in the United States, when we saw the enactment of you know state data breach laws, there was this idea of reasonable security measures. And at the time, it was just this amorphous concept uh, and, and businesses really had the onus of uh, developing compliance plans that met the outcome of reasonable security measures. And over the last 10 years, we've had a lot of uh, guidance. We have consent decrees. We have explanation as to what exactly reasonable security measures are, but we didn't have it at the beginning. And I think there's a real parallel here. We don't know necessarily what uh, some regulator 10 years from now is going to say is the exact components of a safe and effective AI governance plan, but we have a framework and we can deploy the framework uh, throughout our organization and we can demonstrate that we have this governance practice in place. And once we have that framework, we can quickly sort of pivot and evolve to address some of these new um, guidances and dictates but it's it's sort of like we have the ability to devise our own plan within a framework. So there's a lot of opportunity there as well because the regimes are not so prescriptive currently. I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, fr frankly, for years we've been saying you already know what you need to do to comply. Uh, the the idea is go forth and conquer, you know, <laughs> experiment in a responsible manner, or as we like to say, innovate, but responsibly. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody for joining us today on this webinar. We hope you've learned a lot. Please do get, get in touch with us if you have any additional questions. We appreciate your time. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.